So let me just say welcome. My name is Peter Allison. I'm the director at Firmed Institution New England. I'm actually based up here in Vermont. Um, and really excited to welcome you to uh, this forum on the impact in the correction sector of COVID-19. This is part of a series of forums that we've been holding related to the impact of the pandemic on uh, the institutional food system. And the first focused on the correction sector, not just the first thing, the impacts of COVID-19, but really the first online forum we've done um, related to prisons and jails and the correctional sector in general. And why while FINE has done a little bit of previous work in this area, uh, featuring workshops at our two previous firmed institution summits, it's definitely a sector that we are newer to and humbly recognize there's a lot that we don't understand, which is one of the reasons that we're so excited about this forum today, to learn from all of you and learn about how we can be of greatest support to this growing network and to this sector. Um, we have over the past uh, six months assembled a really great um, advisory group who've been helping us think about that. Some of you are on the call today. Um, and Brett, I'm wondering if you would take, um, put the link from our blog about the advisory group in the chat box so people can see who all is a part of that. Um, we've also been um, fortunate with Britt Florio doing a lot of background research and interviews with people related to this sector and the work they're doing, challenges, successes, and also to team up with the Vermont Law School um, and the Center for Ag and Food Systems who've been doing research on some of the policy issues, policy undergirdings of food in the corrections sector. And that, um, the product of that research will be coming out next month and we'll be making, we'll make sure that all of you uh, get a sense of that. For FINE though, broadly speaking, we are still figuring out how our resources as a backbone, a network backbone organization can be of greatest use. And um, we'll be working through some of those issues this summer and again, communicating back. Um, today, what we're looking to do is to, we'll hear uh, first, from Mark McBride, who's the food service uh, director at the um, uh, facility in Maine. And he's going to talk a little bit about some of the work that they've been doing in, um, in, since COVID-19 has hit. There's some other folks who we know have done uh, quite a bit of work. And we'd love to hear briefly from them on some updates. And then we're going to move into breakout rooms so that um, this relatively larger group will have a chance to speak in smaller, um, in a smaller group for a while. And then we'll come back and talk together and move forward toward next steps. Um, so once again, I invite everyone to uh, name yourself on your uh, Google, on your uh, <laughs> uh, Zoom screen in the upper right, the three dots, you can go to rename and put in your name and preferred pronouns organization as you wish. And then also to put that information in the chat. Um, so with that, I am going to ask that we, um, Mark, you want to wave? Say hi to everyone. Okay. Oh, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna um, move to, um, show some slides that Mark is going to talk through and we'll have a little bit of time for questions and answers after he finishes. So with that, if we could bring the slides up, that would be great. Thank you. So Mark, uh, take it away. Once again, Mark is the food service manager at the Mountain View Correctional Facility in Charleston, Maine. And um, welcome, Mark. Welcome, Peter. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, thank you, Brittany and Abra and Sarah for your help in making this all possible. Was there one slide before that with the paper on it, Brittany? There you go. Um, so when Peter asked me just how things were going during uh, the COVID-19 situation, if I would like to have a chance to, to speak about it, I figured we'd just kind of start out with where it all began. We were um, told what was coming and that we needed to be prepared to 
feed our population in uh, because of uh, the dangers that um, were thought to be uh, coming by the fact of having large groups of people in a small area. And we were uh, told throughout the state at the different facilities that we would have to um, feed three meals a day in their uh, rooms or in their uh, pods or, or units or, or dorms. And we really felt that at our facility, if we could try to come up with an alternative that would allow us to feed our population at least part of the time in the dining hall, that it sure would help um, just the general uh, well-being and emotional uh, needs of the inmates. And so came up with an idea that we would uh, mark out each chair in each of our two dining halls and make sure that we could get six feet apart. And so we put X's on the seats and we were able to fit 24 in one dining hall, 34 in another and figured out that by doing this and alternating the different groups through that we could end up feeding half the population in at each meal and the other half in their dorms. And then the second day we would just switch and go back and forth. And so it was a lot of work, but we, um, we set out to do that. And the idea we were asked to do it with paper, uh, the paper containers, you know, you'll see some of the cups and the different things. So we started out doing that first two days and then realized that financially and just for the waste of the paper, it was just amazing. And so one of our inmates actually came up with an idea. And if you go to the next slide, uh, during this time, we had to bring all of our workers that were work release people that were going out to jobs back off the streets and back into the facility and they weren't allowed to go out. And by doing that, all the coolers that we had for these work release were now not being used. And one of our inmates said, boy, we could save a lot on paper if we just use these coolers and put our meals in that we're delivering in the coolers. And so that's what we started to do. And to give you an idea, at Main State Prison, it's close to getting, approaching close to $1,000 a day for paper that they're using. But because of this one thing that we were able to change, it's, it's virtually taken our costs for paper down to very, very nil. And um, so that's worked well. Um, if you go to the next um, slide, you'll see these are all ready to go, taken in the van. Um, we don't have all kinds of fancy warmers and things like that, but we put these things in these insulated trays and take them over, deliver them to the dorms. And the rest of the population on every other day gets to come in the dining hall and continue doing what they were doing. And it really gives them something to look forward to. Um, we, we definitely, you know, believe the importance of comfort food. I mentioned to Peter that, uh, you know, some of the different research I've seen on comfort food, it's, it's worth looking at because uh, just what food does for people, especially in stressful situations and uh, intense situations, we wanted to try to minimize everything that we could about this situation. A lot of these people were losing jobs that were making, you know, $20 an hour or more um, going out to work release. And all of a sudden they had to come back into this situation. Uh, many of them would be released within the next six months to a year and that income was lost and it's an important thing. So we wanted to try to make it as easy as we could. So one, we tried to make sure they could still have a chance to dine at least every other day. And the other thing we tried to do was make sure that we could do special meals. And if you go to the next slide, um, we started to think about the fact of what is the most important meal that the inmates all like throughout the year and without uh, exception, everyone thought it was Thanksgiving. So we uh, talked to some local producers, W.A. Bean, a local meat producer here, and sure enough, they had turkeys that were free range turkeys that usually we wouldn't even be able to afford to buy. And because of the whole COVID thing, and it was early on in this situation, they, they sold us the turkeys for 59 cents a pound. And we were able to do a full Thanksgiving dinner and it was a real hit. And just that, just the, uh, the thought of Thanksgiving, we told them, look, you know, even during these times, this was early on within the first couple of weeks, said, you know, we, we can be thankful. It's not as bad here as it is some places. And, 
and it really was a, a big impact. And sadly, I mentioned to Peter, the chaplain came to me that evening and said that the inmates were so amazed by this that five of them actually asked him if this was their last meal and they were going to be taken in and, and gassed because they'd heard the stories in Italy that had happened during the COVID and how they had abandoned the prisons and some of the things that had taken place. And, and they were assured that no, it wasn't. And, and we went on from there, but it, it really did make a, it, it was almost hard for them to believe that we had done this. So we, we went on from there and figured we better make sure that we don't uh, stop um, with that or they're gonna be wondering. And uh, so if you go to the next slide, we uh, tried to do some special things. We took the leftover turkey that we had from the meal, picked that all out. And my grandmother always made uh, uh, turkey or chicken pie whenever we got done with Thanksgiving and put biscuits on top. So. I showed the guys how to make the biscuits. We do a lot, we do our own bread and everything, but sometimes good bread makers aren't good biscuit makers. They think you have to knead the dough and it comes out about like clay pots. So I worked with them on the biscuits and we made this turkey pie. That was another big hit. Um, this gentleman here is one of the cooks in the kitchen and um, he's of Asian descent and he's really good. He's always making little uh, meals for the kitchen crew, doing things that, are from his uh, native country. And so we did a, a Chinese meal and he made uh, all the egg rolls for both facilities. We did an orange chicken, sesame chicken meal. And he was pretty excited about the fact that he could do this and we cooked off the egg rolls and that was a big hit. We tried to do some different things that just would uh, um, be something that could, uh, you know, change the mood and during these, times that were stressful, just try to lessen some of this. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, one of the things that we took advantage of is that many of these companies early on were having a hard time, Cisco and others, because of the schools and the restaurants and things that were closed down, we were given opportunity to buy certain things at a very discounted rate. And we tried to really look for that and take advantage of it. We have a cake mix that's just a basic cake mix that a lot of facilities have and it costs us about eight cents a portion. It's not, you know, it's not any great, um, you know, delicacy, but it's what we do on a regular basis. And so we were offered uh, two pallets of uh, uh, Baskin Robbins ice cream at, and it was eight cents for that serving. So we were able to get the ice cream in and mix that with some of our cakes and uh, we made some uh, apple crisp and things like that. And that was a big hit. And, and it, again, it was just um, trying to make connections with these people. And one of the inmates came up with an idea that they could do something special. We tried to, during this time, ask them, is there anything that you have for an idea you think would be good? And one of the inmates came up with a way of making a, a pastry bag out of a plastic bag and taking the peanut butter and making a frosting and they halfway through the cake being cooked, they injected the peanut butter down into that chocolate cake and made, uh, made a little treat for them that way. These are cinnamon buns that the bakery crew made on the right. If you go to the next slide, you'll see uh, those are a banana um, morning glory muffin that the guys made with uh, bananas and carrots and some of the different things. We had some raisins and just a specialty thing for breakfast. And this is one of the fancy, we have chocolate cake and vanilla cake, but one of the bakery guys that used to work in the bakery that I talked about that was off, came back and worked in the kitchen. And he said, hey, I can make fancy cakes. So he made these fancy marble cakes and it's no different than any other mix, but it was just something that was fun for these guys. And, and it went over really well. If you go to the next slide, um, basically just, we have a bakery program. We bake all our own bread, all our own rolls. Um, you know, er everything that we have, buns, hot dog buns, sub rolls. Um, we also do specialty things like English muffins and, and, um, pita pockets and things like that. And during this time, we really tried to do a bunch of those. If you go to the next slide, um, we, 
got a call from Cisco because we were being proactive and that and checking with them every day. They called and said, we'd like to give you opportunity first. We have whole boneless prime ribs and the restaurants aren't open. No one's there to take it. We need to, we need to sell this while it's good. And we'd be willing to sell it to you for less than you pay for ground beef. And, um, they sold us these whole prime ribs for $2.49 a pound. And we, uh, we did a, a dinner meal with uh, uh, ribeye steaks on Memorial Day with French fries and all. We did uh, roasted uh, um, Brussels sprouts from a local Maine farmer that Cisco had purchased from, had cases and cases of them. They sold us for like $5. We roasted the, the Brussels sprouts and that was a big hit. If you go to the next slide, these are a, a three colored carrot from a main farmer that we were able to use for a lot of different things. We roasted them and uh, we also bought cases of beets from a main farmer through Cisco that they had and no one wanted and we bought 50 pound bags and we made beet pickles, showed the guys how to do beet pickles. Um, I come from a farm background that's used to this kind of thing. So just tried to use it as a teaching uh, tool and we made like 12 five gallon buckets of beet pickles and gave them something different that we could do. If you go to the next slide, um, these are also some of the, the ribs that we took and on another occasion we roasted them, put the mirepoix on, baked them off and did a uh, sliced prime rib. Um, we did that with baked potatoes. Obviously that was a big hit. Um, we had them pretty much convinced that they weren't going to get another meal. They, every time this happened, they were pretty nervous that this was it, but um, it, 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 it really went over big. Um, if you go to the next slide, we, um, we get cheese from a main producer, um, Pineland Farms, and this is a Colby Jack and we decided, okay, rather than just give eggs and sausage and home fries, whatever, we made buns and um, did that once and we made English muffins another day and made breakfast sandwiches with some of the main cheese and the sausage and the egg and that was a big uh, hit, just something different so that it was a, a change. That's, that's a big thing with these guys just to, to get something different. If you go to the next slide, that is, I guess that's it. Is that the last one? That okay. is the last one, Mark. Um, but we we just during this time tried to do anything that we could. You know, I say this, it's really not rocket science. It's just, it's trying to care and do these things. Um, they didn't cost us other than time. And sometimes I think with inmates, that's important because they know how valuable time is. And if you're willing to spend the time they take that personally. We've got a lot of messages during this time that this has really meant a difference to them. And it, it hasn't been the easiest course of action for us to take, but it's definitely proven to lessen. We've had very little incidents of things that some other places have had. Um, and I really believe the food and, and this whole um, atmosphere has helped this situation. Mark, thanks so much. It's an incredible story. And we know it's not um, what's happening in every facility around the region or around the country by any means, but um, it's inspiring to hear what you've been able to do and, and pivot supporting some of the food that other institutions, restaurants weren't able to use from Maine and engaging the inmate um, in both inmates, both in terms of design and, and, and working that stuff. Um, I'm curious if there are questions that folks have for Mark. We can take a couple um, at this time. Some comments in the chat about people wanting some of that cake, I think. I have a question. Sure, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Robin McGraw. I'm a, uh, uh, I work at a correctional facility in Berkshire County. Um, uh, Berkshire County, Massachusetts. I'm not really sure if this is coming from Maine. Are we coming from me? Yeah. So uh, I, I won't go into what I'm doing for later, but my question was, uh, is he allowed to use uh, any produce he gets, uh, he can get from local farmers? It's, in other words, it's all stuff that's coming from, you know, bonafide farms and everything like that, but he can use whatever he can find? 
all of that came through Cisco, actually. Um, it, I, I can use stuff from farmers as long as, um, as long as they are, you know, they follow FISMA and the things that need to be, you know, if they're approved to sell to a place like a, a Hannaford or one of those places or, um, or Cisco, or then yes, we can, we can do business with them, but they, they would have to, I can't just stop at a, at a stand down the road and grab something. Right. So Cisco is your main supplier of food. It is. They're our prime vendor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, there's a question in the chat about um, your general food purchasing practices, even outside of COVID. Um, and you just mentioned that you use Cisco as your prime vendor. Do you have any other distributors that you're that are currently delivering, or are there other ways that you're able to um, sort of uh, how you go about purchasing food in general? I guess is the question. Cisco's our prime vendor. We, um, but we always look for um, other places that we can purchase, um, and if we can find something that um, is local and it fits our needs and it's within the price point that we can use it and if it's something that Cisco cannot provide at that price then we're allowed to then purchase it okay. and we try to take advantage of that and we do do business with you know some local we have uh, WA Bean is a local processor that we get meat through um, and Pineland Dairy I mean there are places that we could purchase cheese we could get it from Cisco whatever but because we can find cheese that is, you know, in the store, eight ninety nine, nine ninety nine dollars a pound, and we end up getting it for $2 a pound, then we, um, we've we taken care of the fact that, you know, Cisco is not going to match that price, and yet we've helped a, a local vendor and got a really good product. Great. Um, and Barbara Joaquin has a question in the chat. And Barbara, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to ask it yourself. Or I can, but I'm not sure I... Okay, here we go. I okay, had... great, thanks. There we are. Uh, maybe not to take up too much time. Maybe, Mark, we can just discuss this afterwards. I'm in the process of writing an article about what everybody's doing in food service for corrections. And this just fits in perfectly with what's going on. Um, but I was curious about the dining hall versus the feed-ins. And when you altered, was that like one whole housing unit or half the facility ate in the dining hall one day and the other half ate in their cells that day and you just switched off every day yeah we did odd days one even days the next and okay. that one one dorm came one day one dorm the next and and then one of our largest dorms with dorm one has twice the amount we did um top floor one day and bottom floor the next okay thank you and, that, and on the medium side that you've been to our facility we we just did half the uh, units in and half um, came to the chow hall. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, we had a question earlier about um, the use of PPEs in the facility and to what extent are those being distributed? Um, like who's using them, who has access, who pays for them? Um, are they used, it sounds like most of the work is any of the out, outside of facility work has sort of stopped and you've come back in. But um, if you just comment a little bit on the use of PPEs inside the facility. All staff and inmates must wear PPEs unless they can social distance. Um, obviously while they're eating, they're six feet apart. While they're going through the chow line, they must still wear that. All the people in the kitchen while they're working on the food have to wear the PPEs. Um, and then, you know, once they're eating, obviously they take them off. Um, and as, if you're going across the parking lot or you're going down the hall, anywhere that you're traveling, you have to wear PPEs. We provide those to the inmates and the staff. Um, and we've had some people that have had breathing problems that um, weren't able to wear some of the thicker masks. And we even though they're very high cost, we provided 
some people in the kitchen in places where it's very hot with a lighter mass that was um, tested by medical to, to make sure they were getting enough oxygen. Thanks. Um, I'm gonna actually go right now to um, someone else who I asked to share a little bit of information. Um, Leslie Sobel, who's with the um, with Impact Justice as a research fellow, has been spending a good part of the last year or more looking at issues of food and corrections around the country. And in the recent weeks, she's been learning a little bit about some of the trends and um, uh, activities that are happening since COVID-19. And Leslie, I'm just wondering if you'd be willing to comment a little bit about some of the findings you've had before we go into a breakout. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. It's nice to see everyone. Um, you know, I wish I wish all of the facilities uh, looked like what's happening in Mark's facility. Um, and as always, um, Mark's Kitchen is the gold standard of correctional facility food. Um, I'm not sure if anyone saw the Marshall Project's recent report about prison food in Texas. I'll put it in the chat um, just in case folks haven't seen it. But a lot of what we've been hearing about and seeing um, are things, you know, that are significantly worse than usual in terms of food. We've seen a lot of uh, facilities where people aren't getting hot meals anymore. A lot of facilities where people are now being served only twice a day, where they were getting meals three times a day beforehand. A lot of bagged meals that are day after day, meal after meal of just, you know, bologna sandwiches and chips. Um, a lot of facilities where folks have not seen a vegetable now in a few months. Um, facilities where the people who are preparing the food are not provided with PPE and places where people have actually tested positive for COVID and are still told to go and work in the kitchen and work distributing the food. Um, we've seen places where folks are still seated together in super crowded dining areas, are not provided with hand sanitizer or any means to wash their hands before they eat. So, you know, on, on basic public health like public health levels and on basic nutritional levels, um, you know, pretty much around the country, the food quality has really taken a pretty, you know, pretty big nosedive, um, much worse than it usually is. Lots of folks are complaining and unfortunately a lot of DOCs are just saying that they don't have the capacity to do anything better right now. Um, you know, or a lot of times they're just not necessarily willing to do a lot better right now. And, um, you know, I think, looking at what's happening in the country right now on a larger level, looking in terms of racial justice, like this is also a racial justice issue of who is, who is being provided with this food, who is being asked to eat these meals and to live like this without, you know, proper nutrition, without um, sanitary conditions in which to eat meals. So, you know, sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but, um, you know, basically the opposite of what's happening in Mark's facility is what's happening around the country and most other places. Thanks, Leslie. Um, just curious if anyone has a follow-up question for Leslie. Thanks for sharing that link to the Marshall Project. Yeah, I encourage everyone to look at that. There were some photos taken by folks who are currently incarcerated, and you can see the, the pictures of what they're actually eating right now. Well, what a like to do now and there'll be a little bit of time at the end as well is we're going to actually ask um sarah is going to split us up into breakout groups so that we all have a little bit more of an opportunity to uh talk about um our particular areas of interest and then we'll we'll come back together as a group um which is going to take a, a quick poll and then we'll talk about wrap up, but really curious to hear from each of you in the small groups about challenges, successes, questions, um, opportunities that you see. And um, from that, we're also hoping to gain any insights about how we can be of use in, um, in serving the sector. So Sarah, when you're ready, we'll do that and we'll have about uh, 10 minutes or so, and we'll have a one minute warning before we wrap up and we have a facilitator for each group who's been set up ahead of time which will who will um walk us through that small group exercise okay. oh.
Here we go. Well, welcome back. We're just going to take a, another moment while the rest of the group joins. Um, if you don't see the poll, let me know. Otherwise, we'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, what we'll do next um, for, for the next corrections sector focused uh, discussion. And apologies for any great conversations that got cut short. I hope those conversations don't stop here. All right, I think we're all here because we're not all there. We have, thanks for laughing, Brittany, that's nice of you. <laughs> Realized I was mute. I was laughing too, sir. Um, <laughs> as Sarah said, feel free to fill out the poll on the side of your screen or move it to the side and fill it out. Um, and we're going to hear a really quick uh, feedback from each of the small group leaders. And then we'll um, go to a little more discussion, get the results of the poll, and wrap up by three. Britt. What do you got? You're on mute. So sorry, I'm back. Um, so we had a great conversation in our group. Um, Robin McGraw shared that they are have an aquaponics facility that took three years to raise the money and build. And it is a 60 by 70 foot greenhouse that has fish and grows about 11,000 heads of lettuce. Um, that lettuce is getting served outside to the community right now. And um, when health and safety inspections uh, get, get certified, it is a plan to serve it to the incarcerated folks within their facility, which is uh, very exciting. Um, we also talked about um, prisoners making personal protective wear, which is happening um, both at uh, Maine State Prison, the Maine DOC, and Massachusetts as well and we talked a little bit about how incarcerated folks are getting compensated for that sometimes a small amount of monetary stipend and also sometimes um, a bit of time off of their sentence um, yeah and it was a great conversation it just was never long enough but thanks for everyone who was in my breakout room that's all for us hi this is uh, Sarah Lyman we had um Sarah, Sarah, and Sarah, and Teresa, and Barbara, and Allie. So that was really accidental. I, but, and uh, actually, a lot of our conversation focused um, around comparing and contrasting what we heard from in Maine versus what some of our um, group had experience uh, in Vermont, and mostly contrasting um, and uh, about how farms in particular can better interface um, with Vermont correctional facilities um, how how they can um, better mitigate partnerships in general with out with partners outside of the facility walls and to really leverage those mutually beneficial uh, assets there um, so I'll keep it short there um, I, I will, Sarah, offer a little clarification because I know that Brian um, Matofsky is on this call. He um, is a little bit of an exception. There are certainly some good work happening in the in the corrections kitchens, but I think um, kind of more dynamically looking at uh, efforts within and engaging corrections could, could go beyond just food sourcing. So. That's great. Thank you, Teresa. Yeah, sort of finding those um, things that are working really well and doing doing more of that and spreading that. Thanks. So, you know. Yeah, I'm reporting out on behalf of Leslie, Nicole, Kate, and Molly. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to actually ask Leslie, maybe you could share some information in the chat, um, an example that came out of Baltimore, a farm to prison program happening there that's working on the pipeline between um, local urban farms and facilities. And um, if there's any information you can share with the group, I'm sure others would like to see that. Um, and then we talked um, mostly about, I'd say the intersection between local procurement and education and um, garden activities and 
some of the policies that allow or do not allow garden grown food um, on site to be served in the dining halls um, and sort of the policies that um, exist at the state level and monitor those things. Um, and also I just, I'll add, um, Kate shared a little bit about um, the importance of connecting um, education and uh, food systems courses to this conversation and how that sort of makes the local procurement piece feel a little bit more um, holistic, um, which is really valuable to hear. Thanks, Hannah. This is Abra, she, her, hers, and with the Franklin County Jail in Greenfield, Mass, and consult for fine. Um, we had an extremely small group. It was really Brian Matofsky and myself having a conversation. Um, we had a brief hello by Kristen Wilson, whose call dropped, and Maxine Shadalov was not able to um, join with audio, unfortunately. So, um, really got to hear some of the great successes that Brian has been working on up with the Vermont DOC, a lot of local food purchasing from Cabot and other um, regional suppliers. And it sounds like the big question or ask that Brian is bringing forth is that um, while Vermont has had a lot of success with their Act 38 that encourages local food purchasing, there actually is no definition for regional food purchasing in contrast and um, imagines that FINE could play a role in making Vermont uh, generate a definition around regional procurement and there could be um, some more efforts on the state level in Vermont and perhaps elsewhere to uh, encourage regional and additional to, to local. And I'll pass it to Tanya. Thanks, Sabra. Um, so I'm sharing back from a conversation with Tony Hall from Greenfield, Mass, a garden instructor, uh, Matt Del Sesto from, with the New Garden Society, and Lita Cooks is a researcher. And um, we heard from Tony and Matt about how there's been really significant changes in the programs that they've been able to, uh, in their programs that, um, that they've been able to, that they've been having to manage. Uh, from Matt really having things pretty much shut down to Tony having things really rest on his shoulders instead of being the broader program he'd been building up. So clearly, you know, concerns and frustrations around that, but also there were some things that we talked about in terms of shared opportunities and collaborative efforts that included um, trying to make the, this kind of work more public and visible, um, that a lot of this is under the radar and really trying to have that out in the public more and get, get Gardner support, I think. Um, looking also at the impacts from COVID-19 and whether these are going to be short or long term and how we can also think about using this as an opportunity to maybe change and improve things. Tony had a really great example that maybe if you have a sec to share in the chat or we'll be able to share out later. And also just being able to share lessons learned. Um, Tony also shared about one example he heard of from an, uh, from an inmate that had come into his area um, recently. And so it was really interesting to hear about what was going elsewhere. And there's not a lot of visibility into that. So again, sort of back to making things really visible and information available across different programs and systems would be really helpful. And that's it from us. Great. And um, I will go uh, reporting in for uh, Keone, Trevor, Rebecca, and Ali Burlow and myself. Um, we had some discussion about and questions about how does the food operations change, whether it's a state run facility versus private. There's actually very few private facilities in New England, but we know nationally that there's many and many big ones. And um, maybe something that will come out from Leslie's uh, research as well. And a related question is how do um, self-operated facilities compare to those that have contracted food service management? And one insight was that the need to find lowest cost uh, food is often more prevalent with the contracted food service operators um, and less ability to go off, off contract. Um, and Rebecca from the Maine State Prison shared that last year they produced 20,000 pounds of vegetables on the local farm at the state prison on 1.8 acres and she has an ambitious goal of 25,000 pounds for this coming year 
which we're going to follow up with her in October to see how it went. And she's committed to um, making that goal become a reality. I'm just going to hit the share results of our poll here. Um, sounds like folks are very interested in looking at the issue of the intersection of racism and um, at the intersection of food and carceral systems and more on local food procurement, as well as sort of a good third of people interested in those other types of issues. Um, we also have a question from Christine James that I'm wondering if Abra or Mark or Brian um, or some of the others may be able to, or Leslie could comment on, which is that, is there a national network or coalition that brings together corrections, commissary staff, food service directors, farm and garden directors, uh, who share innovative, positive things that they're doing. And, and Matt, I know you also are involved in network here. So somebody want to comment briefly about um, national networks of folks who are working in these, these spaces? See, Leslie, I see that you chimed in with a response. Um, I was just going to say quickly, uh, a couple of years ago when I was working for the nonprofit, I was able to put together a national directory of uh, individuals, organizations, and DOCs that were doing um, carceral garden work across the country. Um, I have that if someone wants to access it. I've tried to keep it updated, but things are changing so dramatically. Um, that I just haven't had the opportunity to keep up with it right now. Um, but also we had been invited to speak at a conference in March and I can't remember what that is, but that was in the hopes, I can't remember what that was called, but that was in the hopes of creating some sort of like national coalition, at least along the perimeters of like sustainability and gardens and prisons. Yeah, that and was- I can share uh, that information with anybody if they need it. We'd love to get that and, and help share it out. And uh, the conference you're referring to, I think is the one that Matt Del Soto, who I think is still on the call, um, organized on um, so it's social and environmental strategies for reducing recidivism, Mark, uh, Brian? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, yeah, so this is Matt, um, and uh, yeah, so the, that conference is gonna happen um, next March, and um, uh, I know we're very interested in um, helping to, um, create a space that will facilitate those kinds of connections and hopefully a space that will endure beyond a single one-off event. So I can put the link um, uh, prisongardinjustice.org, which is where we'll be um, kind of posting uh, updates to the event or series of events that will be happening next spring, probably a combination of in-person and virtual. So. <clears throat> It's great. And we will share um, the, I didn't re mention this, but we'll share the notes of, um, of this in the recording with folks who've been a part of it today. Um, and Mark or Brian from the food service side um, or um, others, are there, Robin, are there networks nationally or, or places where you all from the food service side of things connect with others who are doing this kind of work? Mark, you're on uh, mute. Sorry about that. Uh, I don't know if Barbara's still on or not, but she could talk about one group. And I know Leslie has um, done some work with them, um, Association of Correctional Food Service. Um, are you still there, Leslie? I'm still here. Yeah. You could talk about that a little bit, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I can let Barbara definitely knows more about that organization um, than I do. Um, but the, also, I want to say there is currently also a national working group um, based through the American Heart Association and the Center for Science in the Public Interest, uh, which Mark is also a part of that group as well. Um, that is looking at creating some national nutritional standards uh, for correctional facilities. So that's, it's not quite the same thing as what Christine was asking about, but it is a group looking more nationally in scope at 
what's happening in correctional facilities. But I'll let Barbara talk more about the Correctional Food Service Association. Okay, thank you. I didn't realize this was gonna be so interactive when you invited me today, Mark. <laughs> um, I chair the Dietitians and Corrections for ACFSA, and it's an international correctional food service organization, and their website is acfsa.org. Um, it's over 50 years old, and it's comprised of all levels of correctional food service people, as well as um, registered dietitians. So all the food vendors that contribute to this organization and the equipment vendors and everybody that supports it, their main focus or a lot of their focus is corrections and they make a lot of products specific to corrections. So we're a small tight knit group, uh, but we reach, you know, everybody's welcome in our organization. Actually the conference they usually have an annual conference and then regional conferences. And this year, the conference was in September in Minneapolis. And I just learned that it was canceled uh, because of COVID and it's rescheduled for August of 2021. Uh, but as I had mentioned earlier, I was writing, I'm writing an article right now about all the impact of COVID in correctional food service. And I had surveyed uh, several state agencies and correctional food service people within this organization to find out what changes in their practices are. And they're all over the board, some of which you all mentioned. And Mark, of course, is on the high end and uh, of being able to be creative where the other there are others that have gone to the two meals, et cetera. So I could go on and on about that, but I won't. Um, so ACFSA uh, would be a group that you would wanna maybe introduce, you know, to get involved. In fact, as I was on this, I emailed the president of ACFSA about this particular um, webinar meeting um, and told him it was going to be recorded. So maybe he can jump in on it later on. His name is Tim Thielman. Great. Thank you, Barbara. And thank you, everyone. And we are at time and I want to respect all of your schedules today. Appreciate um, all the work you're doing and, and appreciate the fact that you engaged with us today. We will get back to you with the uh, information from today and we are very interested in keeping the channels of communication open so ideas questions uh, concerns uh, please send them our way check out our website firmedinstitution.org um, and we will be in touch with uh, next steps so once again thank you all and uh, have a nice afternoon